We are really lucky to be joined by Dennis today, who is a member of our National Advisory Board and has probably been working on proportional representation for longer than any of us, even in Fairville, Canada. And some days that feels like a long, very long time, probably at least 30 years now. There is a great book written by Dennis called The Politics of Voting, Reforming Canada's Electoral System, and it is now free online, and you can get it at that URL. So if you are brand new to Fairville Canada, and I hope there's a few of you, and by brand new, I mean anybody in the last couple of years, and you're just tuning in to what we're about, we are a national citizens campaign for proportional representation. And we have chapters and volunteers from coast to coast, and we are about 99% volunteer powered. So one of the main takeaways that we want you to get out of this webinar is that there's two broad families of voting systems. There's winner take all systems, which are also sometimes called majoritarian systems, and there are proportional systems. And there are, there are many different um, variations under each family, but the systems in each family have a lot in common with each other. Oh, the other little note here, this is from a previous webinar, is that either of these families of systems can have systems in them that use a ranked ballot. So a ranked ballot is not actually a voting system, it's just a tool. And you can have proportional systems that use a ranked ballot, and we'll be talking about one of those, and you can have winner-take-all systems that use a ranked ballot as well. So what is proportional representation? Well, it's really a simple concept that says that people should be represented in proportion to how they voted. And if you want to talk about it in a way that's a bit easier to understand, that talks about parties and party votes, if a party gets 30% of the vote, they should get about 30% of the seats, not 10% of the seats or 60% of the seats. Uh, so you can look at it from a person-centered perspective or a party-centered perspective, but basically we should get what we vote for. So I'm going to talk about a few of the problems with first past the post. So the first biggest problem is wasted or ineffective votes. And by that, I mean voters who cast a ballot who did that did absolutely nothing. They elected nobody and their vote made no difference to the impact of the parliament. So that's what you might call wasted. And that is like the foundation problem for all the problems that come from first past the post. The fact that most of our votes don't actually do anything. And so maybe perhaps if you've been brought up in a winner-take-all system, all you've ever voted with is first past the post, and of course we live next to the U.S. and they have winner-take-all voting, it just seems sort of normal, then you think, well, there has to be a winner and there has to be a loser, right? Some people have to lose. But that's actually not how most modern voting systems work. In most countries, they use proportional representation. The idea is that almost everybody is able to help influence the makeup of the legislature. So in the last federal election, you can see that uh, millions and millions of voters, about 52% of voters overall, cast ballots that didn't actually do anything. So they were sort of symbolic, or as one of our colleagues used to say, um, you know, I'm pushing the elevator button, but the elevator is not coming. It's sort of like that. So and you, a lot of time in the media, we get an idea that, you know, it's all about the Green Party, you know, or some spirit, a small party that wants to be represented. And certainly that's very important. But it's also important to recognize that most of the voters in Canada that are casting votes that elect nobody are voters for the large parties. Another problem with first past the post is safe seats in swing ridings. So you probably know you're in a safe seat if the party that always wins your riding could run a lamppost or a poodle and they would still win the riding. If that's the case, you know you live in a safe seat. And if you live in a safe seat, because it's not terribly competitive, it's sometimes there's a little difficulty finding motivation to go out and vote. And then you have the contrast of that, which is a handful of ridings in Canada, which are swing ridings. And this is an advertisement uh, from a a uh, marketing company from a few years ago, basically advertising saying, you know, political parties aren't focused on every voter in every riding, only those that matter the most. And you should be too. And that's basically the gist of it. If you don't live in one of these swing ridings, uh, you really don't matter very much to the parties. And that's in contrast to what we see in countries with proportional representation. So this is an advertisement encouraging people to vote in New Zealand from several years ago. And it's just saying your vote is worth exactly the same as mine. And that's a powerful thing. 
And that is what we're trying to get to in Canada with proportional representation, where no matter who you vote for or where you live, your vote matters just like somebody else's vote does. Another problem with first past the post and that you're probably pretty familiar with distorted election results. So here you can see in the 2008 election, which is an example we often point to just because it's so stark, but we could pull up about 100 different examples. This is just an easy one to use. You can see the Bloc Québécois, the number of people that voted for the Bloc Québécois and the number of people that voted for the Green Party were pretty close to equal. And yet voters for the Bloc managed to elect themselves 49 MPs, whereas voters for the Green Party managed to elect themselves zero. And that's because obviously the bloc was able to concentrate all their voters in a small geographical area, whereas the green voters are spread out all across Canada. So it's a system that's really focused on, you know, the most popular person in a small piece of geography rather than uh, shared values, how many people there are with shared values. Again, you can see here the 1993 election where the Bloc Québécois became our official opposition party with fewer votes than the Progressive Conservative Party who lost their official party status and was reduced to two seats despite uh, getting more support from Canadians than the party that became our official opposition. And then it gets to situations like this, where in 1997, uh, the Reform Party, which had absolutely no seats east of Manitoba, became the official opposition, which of course creates sort of a problem for how the official opposition represents somebody in Newfoundland, for example. Regional sweeps, and this is closely to connected to what I was just talking about with distorted results. So this is where one party can sweep every single seat in an area, despite the fact that the voters in the area are actually quite diverse. So this is a picture from our 2019 federal election of Alberta and Saskatchewan. And here you can see that as usual, there are about 30 to 40% of voters in Alberta and Saskatchewan that don't vote conservative. Now you wouldn't actually know that, um, looking at the parliament or watching the news, you'd think it's 100% blue out there, but there's actually quite a lot of diversity in both of those provinces. But the result of that was that there is one non-conservative seat in both of those provinces. And uh, the seat isn't somebody from the governing party. So basically, people in those provinces have zero representation in the government, and that causes all kinds of problems. And then on the, in another part of the country, we can see that in the 40 seats in Greater Toronto area, uh, about half of the voters in Greater Toronto did not vote Liberal. But the Liberals won 40 out of 40 seats, every single seat. So if you are a Conservative voter in the Toronto area, who represents you? So it's, it's the, the same problem, you know, but for a different party. And overall, you can see this wonderful little uh, map that Gisela made us, which shows uh, the votes by province and the seats by province. And you can see that across the country, we have tons of diversity in the values that people have. We're really not that different from each other. And yet our voting system really polarizes us into these giant sort of partisan blocks in the parliament. So this is not a new problem. It's not like after 2019, it's like, wow, there's a problem and with Western alienation. Uh, obviously, there, back in 1979, the Task Force on Canadian Unity recommended proportional representation. And they had some, uh, some choice quotes there, you know, when they said the regional polarization of federal political parties corrodes federal unity. In a country as diverse as Canada, this sort of situation leads to a sense of alienation and exclusion from power. And so this is caught back in 1979, it was causing some of the same kind of problems as we as we see today, you know, when you see a, a Western party starting that, you know, is promoting Western separation and that kind of thing. This is a, a very, very old problem. And it's a serious problem. It was urgent 40 years ago, and it's urgent today. Okay, another problem with first past the post is false majorities. So this is one that we talk about a lot. And if you've ever seen a fair vote Canada pie chart, well, they look just like this. And the usual situation is that one party gets about 40% of the vote, sometimes less, sometimes a bit more. And that gives them about 60% of the seats, which gives them about 100% of the power. Um, so 
over the next four years, if that party's doing things that the other 60% of voters don't like, then you get a whole string of, uh, you know, monthly protests and uh, unhappy people and that sort of thing. And that's because the party that's in power doesn't have to consult with anybody, even though only about 40% of voters supported them. And we can see here that uh, since 1945, of all our majority governments, there have only been three that got 50% of the vote. And the last one was in 1984. So we've long since uh, outgrown the two party system, but we're stuck with a voting system that was really designed more for two parties. Another problem with winner-take-all systems that's been identified for decades is the idea of policy lurch. And if you go back to that pie chart I showed where the one party gets 40% of the vote, which leads to 100% of the power, they're bringing in policies that sometimes are widely opposed. And then you have the other parties who are all running on undoing the policies. So, you know, when we get elected, we'll reverse all these bad, evil things that the first party did. And then, you know, one of them gets in with a 40% majority and they reverse everything, you know? So maybe their hero is for a month or whatever for to their partisan base. But what we get is, you know, this policy lurch is back forth, back forth. It wastes time, it wastes money. Um, and, you know, it stops us from tackling some of the long-term challenges that need an, an approach with more continuity. So here's just a, few, a little summary of a few of the problems with winner-take-all systems. Um, anything I didn't mention already? Oh, well, adversarial politics, obviously. You know, when a first-past-the-post system, the party that's closest to you uh, is your biggest enemy, right? Because you're competing. It's a zero sum game. It's winner take all. So you're competing for the same voter. So it can get uh, pretty nasty and a barrier to electing more women and minorities. Um, absolutely, first past the post suppresses diversity in a variety of ways. You know, one of the main ways is that each party uh, can only run one candidate in a riding. And when the candidate nomination race is becomes about putting that one person forward, it makes it really hard for new people to break into the system. Okay, so now I'm going to flip to the other side of this and talk about why we at Fair Vote Canada and millions of other Canadians, a majority actually, support proportional representation. So the first thing to understand is that proportional representation or voting systems are like the foundation of a building or they're like the root of a tree. So how we vote, how that gets translated into seats, and how, is like the, it's like the root, everything else comes out of it. That's how decisions are made. It's all about how decisions are made, whose voice is at the table. So there's been quite a lot of research on electoral systems over many, many decades. And one of the uh, most well-known sort of, I guess, the foundation text, you know, on, on electoral systems was Aaron Leipart's book, Patterns of Democracy. And it's, it's quite academic. It's, I find it, a, it's a tough read. It's not terribly engaging, but it is very informative. And basically, he looked at 36 democracies over quite a long period of time, about 60 years. And he did this study twice. So there's two editions of his book. And what he found was that countries with proportional representation outperformed countries with winner-take-all systems on 16 out of 17 measures of sound government and decision-making. And that included things like, uh, you know, participation, corruption, representation of women, satisfaction of voters, and on and on and on. So voter turnout is definitely one of the things where proportional representation countries have an advantage over us. It's not a huge advantage, but it's a significant advantage, and it's been proven over and over and over again that countries with PR have about a 7% higher voter turnout, and particularly higher among youth. And here you can see a little graph, this about maybe two, three years old, just showing the voter turnout in different countries. And there are the winner take all countries kind of down near the bottom. So one thing that is a little different in countries with PR, now it doesn't mean uh, that, you know, when you get proportional representation, they all hold hands and sing kumbaya and that kind of thing. Politics is politics. There will be nasty things and anybody can cherry pick them off the internet and find them because that's politics. However, um, there's been some research showing what happened in New Zealand after they switched to proportional representation. Somebody analyzed over 800,000 speeches, if you can imagine, 
before and after PR and basically found that the level of anger and the language changed in the New Zealand parliament. And that's partly because when you have to work with other parties in a coalition, whether you're working with them now or you might be working with them in future, then it's really not to your advantage to be doing this kind of let's just attack each other for the sake of attacking all the time. Okay, stability. So one of the more frequent things we see in the media along with Italy and Israel is the whole idea that with PR things will be very unstable, which means we'll be having elections all the time and other kinds of fear based ideas. And uh, Dennis has done some great research just showing that basically there's no difference in the frequency of elections between countries with winner take all systems and proportional systems. And here you can see a little bit of detail on that from 1945 to 2017. So why would that be? So it might not make intuitive sense to you because we have a minority government, right? And what do we hear every month for the last six months? Is there going to be an election, 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 early election? When's the election? Okay. They don't have that in countries with proportional representation because all the parties know that nobody's going to get a false majority. If, if you're a party that's sitting there in the polls at 35% of the vote, why would you want to call an early election? So you could get 37% of the vote, then you get 37% of the seats. Guess what? Nothing changed, except for maybe the voters are all mad at you because you wasted everybody's time. So in, country, in countries with proportional representation, the incentive is to cooperate, to work together, to create policies with broad support. In a winner-take-all system, even when we have a minority government, the incentive is to pull the plug as soon as you think you can get a result where you don't, you're not going to have to work with anybody else. And we've seen that in two provinces already in the last year. So there's also some research uh, showing that coalitions are actually more stable and that businesses, this was a a study conducted by the, the World Bank. Yeah, it was conducted by the World Bank of 100 different companies. And basically, they said they were happier to open a new business in a country with a coalition government because they perceived it to be more stable as compared to, uh, you know, the kind of swing we've seen in Ontario on environmental issues, just for one example. And here you can see how that works. Now, this might look a little complicated, but stay with me here. What I want you to look at, you're looking at Germany and you're looking at Ontario. And what you see in Germany, when the governments change, there's a continuing partner. So you can see how the Social Democrats continued from the first to the second one. All right. And then you can see the Christian Democrat. Do you see what I'm saying? So instead of just, you know, there's a party on the left and then a party on the right and it's completely different policies, you get some continuity and that provides a little bit more stability and predictability for people. And cooperation in OECD countries, our peers, is the norm. Being governed by a single party with a false majority government is the minority. Formal and informal cooperative arrangements are how most of the Western world is governed now. And here you can see a couple of examples. So interesting in New Zealand, they just had an election about oh, six months ago. And because they have proportional representation in New Zealand, no single party had won a majority government in about 20 years, because that's how it works with proportional representation. You don't get 50% support. You don't can't usually govern on your own. But this was an exception. Jacinda Ardern, uh, you know, that we've all probably heard about Jacinda. She did a great job with COVID, several other things. Voters voted uh, her Labour Party to a majority government. What did she do? She turned around and said to the Green Party, hey, how about we work together? even though I don't have to work with you because they had worked together in the previous government. So the Greens got some ministers and, uh, and now you see them in press conferences delivering policies that they worked on together. Now, what's the advantage of that? I mean, she could just go on the tack and say, hey, you know, we're best, everybody voted for us. Well, the advantage obviously is that she can show that she's cooperative and that the policies that are created have broader support. And she's making use of the different talents of the different parties in her parliament. And here you can see another contrast here. This is uh, the government in Finland. And this is a five party coalition. And it may be a little striking that they're all women and they're all mostly uh, younger women. And that's sort of a, as far as you could get from the kind of government we have in Canada. And right now we have, you know, Justin Trudeau with 33.1% of the vote. Of course, it's a minority government, but the one before was a majority with 39%. And so you can sort of see the contrast in, in governing styles and what it must be like a little bit different around the cabinet table, eh? Okay, 
couple more things. So economy. So another thing that we hear a lot from opponents is just that, you know, it goes with the instability thing, right? It's about fear mongering. Oh, well, you know, everything will get so unstable and scary. And then the economy is going to tank you know, because, you know, they're just going to spend themselves out of control and all that stuff. Um, and actually that's been proven not to be true. So you can see uh, that this was a study done of 107 countries over almost 200 years. And they found that countries with proportional representation actually had higher economic growth. So again, it comes back to being able to reflect what people want in the government. And environment, I know this is important to quite a few people that support Fair Vote Canada. So countries with proportional representation, they've been shown to set stricter environmental policies. They acted faster on climate change. They got into climate agreements faster. They did things. They didn't pop back in and out of agreements like the winner take all countries do. Uh, they score higher on the Yale Environmental Performance Index and they make greater use of renewable energy. So that's not to say that everybody in the world doesn't have quite a long way to go on climate obviously, but the countries with PR overall are doing better. Social policy. Another finding that's been repeated over and over is that countries countries with PR have lower income inequality and political preferences of citizens with lower income are better represented in the PR system. So that's not to say that uh, we get PR in Canada tomorrow and all of a sudden inequality goes down. I mean, that's, it's not like that. It's just saying that what PR does is it makes sure that what people want is better reflected in the policy outcomes. That's the, that's the only thing it makes sure of. So if a country, if a large majority in the country decide they want a highly unequal society uh, that just um, creates greenhouse gases to the roof, well, that's what they'll get. But if they decide they want more climate action and they want a more equal society and they want better social programs, they're more likely to get that in a country with proportional representation because their wishes are reflected in what you see in parliament. And this is the same thing with health, which is very timely right now. Um, it was actually yeah, an interesting study about infectious disease control. Anyway, um, so in this study, they looked at 179 countries and over about all oh, 30, 40 years and found that countries with PR, people have higher life expectancy, healthier populations. And this, I'm just just finishing up with a little reminder that uh, over the last, oh, many, many decades, we have had multiple commissions and committees all recommending proportional representation. So here's the way it goes. When you put citizens or experts together at a table and they look at all the evidence, they recommend PR. When you put politicians that are in power together at a table, they say, oh my God, it's too complicated. And by the way, can we do this some other time? Like maybe not now. Now is not a really good time. And plus we can't find a consensus, you know, like uh, so when you when it's you leave it to the politicians, it'll inevitably uh, end up in a stalemate or it'll get uh, boost, you know, booted over to a referendum, which we all know how those go. So. Uh, that's why Fair Vote Canada is advocating for a national citizens assembly on electoral reform because we need citizens to help lead us in the next step because we've had a hundred years of broken promises. So for those that are new to Fair Vote Canada, the first government to promise proportional representation was Mackenzie King's liberal government in 1921. Um, and that was a clear and unambiguous promise that led to the first all party committee, which we know what happens at those. So if this is just a quick snapshot of some of the research on proportional representation, the bottom line is what you're guaranteed is that you're going to get fairer results. That's the only thing that's guaranteed. You'll get fairer results and you'll get policy overall that's better representative of the population. Okay, so that's it for me. And I'm going to turn it over to Dennis to talk about MMP and STV. And I shouldn't use acronyms. So... <laughs> You're on. Well, um, thanks, Anita. And uh, wow, I, I can't believe 160 people, more than 160 people decided to spend their Saturday night talking about my favorite topic. Wow, you are my kind of people. Uh, that is uh, that is great. I'm, I'm glad to see that there is this much interest um, in our topic and uh, people recognizing that we've got work to do and we need to start with the basics. Um, so I've got a, I've got a PowerPoint uh, that I was going to put up. 
And I'm gonna see if I can if I can do that now. I'm gonna hit the share screen and um, there we go. I'm gonna bring this up. And then I'm going to go into the slideshow view. Okay, so now you, you I'll have to, the same as when I'm doing this with my classes, sometimes, you know, if things aren't working out, someone will shout out, someone will let me know. Uh, and, you know, part of the difficulty I have in preparing for something like this is I'm, I'm not really sure where most of you are at. I, I noticed in looking at some of the people's uh, names as they were shouting out where they were from, and there are people uh, here tonight who know more about this than I do. Uh, there are people here who could be running this. Uh, and then obviously there are some people who are probably brand new to the whole idea. So, um, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll run over some basics of the mechanics and then, you know, not spend a whole lot of time in the presentation side, get into the Q&A, and that's where I can find out what you want to know. We can spend the time that we have letting you drive some of the content. So uh, definitely put your questions in the chat. And as we go along, if there are things that aren't clear, or thing you, things you want me to extrapolate on and go into more detail or clarify, then just put all that in there and we'll try to get to as much of that as we can uh, in the more interactive part of the session. So let's uh, I'll run through this and, and give you some of the, the greatest hits, I think, of the topic as I see it. Um, now, uh, Anita talked about the ranking, the ranked ballot stuff, and boy, there's been a lot of confusion on that front, uh, where people have talked about, you know, a ranked ballot system, the ranked ballot, and it, it does lead to a lot of confusion. And so here, this is from my book, uh, which of course I've suggested is available for free, um, and uh, and you can you can go and check all this. But here you can see the breakdown of what I call voting system components. So. Every voting system is made up of three constituent elements, uh, ballot design, a districting choice, and a formula. And so uh, the ballot design is how do you mark the ballot, right? Are you making an X or a check, which is typically what we see with our most of the voting that we do in Canada uh, with the single member plurality or multi-member plurality? Um, or do you make an ordinal marking on the ballot? An ordinal just means one, two, three, right? Just ranking one, two, three. And so you can, you can uh, design your ballot to allow voters to either make a nominal indication or an ordinal indication. And then there are districting choices. Are you going to be electing just one person? Are you going to be electing more than one person uh, from a district? Uh, and we have examples of that in Canada, uh, both single and multi-member versions of plurality. And so you can combine that with these other choices. And then the formula. And the formula is what? Who, how do we decide who wins? What's the threshold uh, that marks um, how you will get one of these seats that's up for, uh, that's being contested? So the formula is, is crucial. Now, the way you put these different component elements together creates the different voting systems that we talk about. So that's, that's in, you know, when you think about a voting system, think about it in terms of these, how these different elements come together. Now here you can see the major uh, voting systems and what I call the voting system families. Now, you know, different po political scientists will talk about this in different ways. And, you know, in a lot of ways, it's just a matter of convention. Uh, you know, nobody's got the right way. It's not like it dropped from the sky. You know, God said this is the way voting systems should be understood. We just come up with these ways of of organizing how to understand voting systems. And so, some academics make the decisions based on the structures of the systems, uh, their component parts. Um, I tend to make the distinction, and many others do, on the basis of the kind of results that they produce. And so, uh, you know, do the results uh, lead to, um, you know, majority? Do people have to produce a majority to get the seat? Are the results overall proportional? Um, and then I, 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 you know, organize the different systems within those uh, families of voting systems. And so here you can see some of the different variants. Uh, so uh, plurality in the plurality family, you can have single and multi-member versions. Uh, those of you from Vancouver, of course, know that you know Vancouver uses a, a multi-member uh, uh, district for the city of Vancouver. In fact, a lot of communities in, in British Columbia use multi-member plurality. Uh, uh, and then you've got majority systems. So here you've got um, 
the difference between, say, the French runoff system and the Australian alternative vote, which uses a ranked ballot. So both have the effect of assuring that whoever wins the individual riding has gained something like a majority of the vote. And then there are various proportional voting systems. And here again, I, I distinguish, there's basically three kinds of proportional representation. So um, now, I mean, there are various um, you know, interesting innovations that people have come up with particularly recently, but in terms of which systems countries actually use, there's roughly three different kinds of PR that are in use. So on the one hand, you've got party list systems, and those are the ones that we are familiar with in the Scandinavian countries and the Benelux countries. So, you know, Holland, Belgium, uh, uh, Sweden, Norway, Finland. Uh, the party list approach uh, is one uh, where uh, there are either the whole country is one riding or there are multiple multi-member ridings. Uh, and the party list system is easy to understand in terms of how the, the PR result is created. But in a country like Canada, with the sort of geography that we have, there's never been any real serious proposal uh, to treat the whole country in terms of party lists. So, it's, so the, the two choices that we often hear people talking about are the MMP or SDV models, the mixed member proportional and the single transferable vote. And these are established systems that have been used for a very long time. Germany, extensive experience from the post-war period. In fact, a very similar mixed member approach was actually used in Denmark for a brief period of time uh, during World War I. So lots of experience hundreds of elections with mixed member proportional and single transferable vote, actually the oldest form of proportional representation uh, used in Ireland since the um, quasi independence uh, in, in, uh, in uh, around World War I, uh, had been used extensively in Canada uh, at, the, at the local level and for elections from urban areas in Manitoba and Alberta in the interwar period. So millions of Canadians have actually already used the single transferable vote. Um, uh, system uh, historically. So lots of uh, lots of, of, of different examples uh, that we can see of these systems actually being used. Now I notice in the chat we're getting lots of interesting insight from uh, from our different experts and that's great. And what they're highlighting is that there there is a lot of debate about how do we understand these systems, uh, how do we name them, how do we talk about them. And I think the important thing is that you know, there's a very high level of discussion, a very technical discussion that we can get into. And that's really for people who are totally geeked out on it. Uh, and if that's your thing, that's great. But the great mass of people are not going to get that much in. And so we need a more conventional way of talking. We need a way that can help people sort out all the details and get at what they think is important. And those are often uh, the politics of the issues. Uh, what are the kinds of results? What are going to be the impact of the reforms that we're talking about? It's very hard. It, it can be very it can be very tricky to 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 come up with a way. In, in a way, you know, I, I like to think of us as activists, as translators. You know, our job is to translate between the deeper, harder, difficult, technical stuff, and what do we think people need to know to be able to participate in this discussion? Uh, and frankly, it's my view that people don't need to know a lot of the technical details uh, to be able to participate in this discussion. In fact, I think that's kind of elitist. I think that people can participate by understanding what's at stake, right? What does this mean for the kind of democracy that we will be a part of? Okay, let's talk about mixed member proportional. Uh, and here I'm just gonna, I'm gonna close some of my windows here so that I can see my own slides, which are now being obscured by this Zoom interface. Um, so here again, I'm just, I'm introducing you to just the basics. Uh, you know, it's gonna be obvious to some of you and, and then some of you are gonna go, I don't understand what you're talking about. That's okay, that's normal. And as I say, we'll get into the chat and hopefully I'll be able to come back to any of the questions that you may have at that time. So the, the mixed member proportional MMP system, um, <clears throat> it, it combines single member ridings with a top up pool of seats that can be used to assure that the overall outcome from the election is going to be proportional. And it typically divides the number of MPs that are to be elected to a house 
in some way. Some countries divided 60-40, maybe 60% of the seats are set aside as local member ridings and maybe 40% of the top-up pool. Others are 50-50, 50, 50, 50 local, 50 top-up. I mean, it really, you know, that's a detail that, that every country has to decide. I'm just going to work with the assumption of 50-50 for mathematical ease of use. Uh, and so if you look at an MMP system, the local member side looks should look very familiar to you if you've grown up in a place like Canada, because basically the election is like a single member plurality election. No difference, really. Um, you're going to go. The voter is going to have to make a choice about who they think should be the representative who represents their local geographic area. So far, nothing has changed. It looks very familiar to us. Um, but of course, that's not the end of the process in an MMP system. In an MMP system, a voter typically has two votes, one for the local member and one for their party choice. The local vote competes in a first-past-the-post <clears throat> like contest to decide who will represent that local area. Meanwhile, the party vote that the voter has indicated will be added up across the country, and that will be used to decide how many seats a party should be getting proportionately overall. So the party vote um, is separate from the local member vote. And uh, the party vote will establish that crucial decision, how many seats should the party end up with when the whole election is done. What's interesting about, a, about an MMP election is it tends to go in stages. So the first stage, the election runs like a first-past-the-post election. And so all the local races are counted up and winners are decided. That's the first part. The second part is where the party choices are tabulated, and they work out how many uh, seats each party should ideally get based on the proportional allocation. <clears throat> and so now they've, they've held the first part of the election, they've tabulated the amount of seats that a party should be entitled to, and now they need to make it all make sense proportionately. Um, and so the top-up pool is used to secure the overall proportional results for the party. So let's say, in my example here, I'm, I'm, I've got party A uh, winning 10% of the party vote. So all that means is that across the country, 10% of the voters were prepared to choose party A as their party choice. Maybe they chose a different party as the, as the local member of someone running locally. It doesn't matter. What matters is that 10% of the voters chose party A as their party choice. Now, it just so happens that party A has already won 10 local seats because in the first part of the election, the local races were decided and party A was in there running in those local races and they won 10 seats. So what do we do? We know that they should get 10% overall. They've got 10 seats already. Well, what we do is we, we work out how many seats they should be accorded based on the size of the house. In this case, I've just said, for the ease of math, that there, there's a 300-seat house, imagine. And so there's a 300-seat house. Half the seats are local races, and half the seats are set aside for the top-up pool. Party A has already won 10 local seats, and we know that proportionately they're entitled to 30 seats. So now what the election officer would do is subtract the 10 seats that they've already won. So now there's 20 seats left. They, they are still owed 20 seats by virtue of the calculations. And so now they will be accorded 20 of the top up pool seats. They'll be able to have a party, they'll have a party list, which they will then take the 20 names, probably the first 20 names off that list, will go into the parliament to represent the voters who had chosen them on the basis of that party choice. So it people can get a bit confused working this out. <clears throat> I would recommend to those of you. Uh, that are interested in knowing more about this allocation to look at some of the resources online. Unlike when we started with this uh, effort 30 years ago, there's actually a lot of great online sources now that will walk you through the vote. And sometimes this is easier to get across to people visually uh, than it is to try to explain it. Um, but nonetheless, sometimes going into the details is a good place to start. Now, I, I brought up a ballot. Here's a ballot from uh, the New Zealand election. And so you can see here, they've got even a counterfoil at the top. Uh, you can see on the screen, I can even, I think I can bring my thing up here to show you. Um, and so, you know, the ballot uh, officer, the election officer will, you know, hand the ballot to the person. And you can see here um, that it tells the voter, you've got two votes uh, and 
on the one side, it's telling voters you can vote for one party. Now, I noticed in some of the examples that um, um, uh, we've seen before, sometimes it says people can rank. That really depends on the country and the details. But in this case, with New Zealand, voters are basically allowed to make what I called earlier a nominal choice about the candidate that they would like to choose for the local race. And so here you can see voters have got the, the symbol of the party and the name of the party uh, for the party vote. Then on the other side of the ballot, they, they also can only choose one candidate uh, and here the names of the different candidates as well as their party indicator is there. So voters are instructed to make a, a check next to the party they choose and for the candidate they choose. So that is what the, ba the ballot looks like. And so you can see that from the voters point of view, it's not that much harder than voting in a conventional Canadian election where someone would basically have just the one side of the ballot. They would have the side that offers people a choice of candidates with their party affiliation. But in New Zealand, voters get another choice, the choice of the party that they prefer. So instead of making one choice, they're making two choices on the ballot. As I say, there's, there's lots of materials online. I did, a, in fact, a video for Fair Vote a number of years ago where I walked through an MMP system, and I encourage you to look at some of those. Now, SDV, this is the other option that is often offered uh, on the table, uh, the single transferable vote. Uh, there are, again, lots of interesting details uh, about the single transferable vote. I'm going to give you a very vanilla treatment of this, uh, just to get the sense of the logic of the SDV system. So the SDV system uses multi-member ridings. Uh, and it has a ranked ballot. And so this is where people get confused because they see a ranked ballot and single member ridings. And we've already talked about that. Uh, so SDV uses multi-member ridings. In Ireland, the ridings will often be a difference between three and five members. Now, under SDV, members are elected by achieving a quota of the total votes that are cast. Now, in a, in a five-member riding, and here I'm just going to use the Hare Clark uh, idea. Um, for those of you who who know all your your different quotas and and um, uh, you know the Drup quota and all this sort of stuff, just put all that aside for the moment. Uh, I'm just going to do a basic mathematical breakdown here. Imagine you've got a five-person riding; five people are going to be elected. Um, the, the quota is going to be roughly one fifth of the total. If you can achieve one fifth of the votes, then you will be entitled to uh, one fifth of the seats, which is one because there's five seats. Um, and of course, if you had won two fifths of the quota, if you know people in that area really, really liked you and gave you lots of number one um, indications on their ballot, then you would have achieved the quota twice. And I'll talk about what happens there in a moment. So you've got these multi-member ridings, and um, uh, candidates have to win a quota to be declared elected, and voters rank the candidates. So it's voters who are deciding directly who are the people who are going to go into office, and they they rank the the ballot on the basis of their preferences one, two, three, four, and so on, as long as they like. In some systems, voters are forced to vote for a certain number, or in fact, maybe put a preference across all the candidates, but there's nothing intrinsic to SDV that forces anyone to do that necessarily. That's a political choice. So voters rank their choices one, two, three, four, as long as they want. Now, to determine the results, all the number one choices are counted. So the first thing the returning officer does, you know, dumps out all the ballots and they count up all the number one choices for the different candidates that there are. And if someone has achieved a quota, if someone has enough number one choices that they have gained more than one fifth, in this case, more than one fifth of the votes, then they would be declared elected. Um, and then we would go along to uh, redistribute any of their surplus. Imagine nobody got the quota, then someone at the bottom, the, the lowest vote getter, the vote getter who got the least number of one number one choices would be eliminated and their ballots would be redistributed on the basis of the next preferences that were marked on the ballots. Remember, it's, it's entirely in the voters' hands. No one's moving ballots anywhere that the voters didn't say. And of course, it's possible that the second choices on the ballot will be quite different than the first choices. Well, of course, they have to be different. But what I mean is that not everyone will choose the same uh, uh, order of preferences. So just the fact that voters all chose this person as their number one choice, it may be that that group of voters have different ideas about who to give number two to. And so then the returning officer will now distribute the votes on the basis of the number two choices. Um, 
without getting into any kind of mathematical complexity, which can come in when we talk about transferring surpluses under SDV, suffice to say that while voters only have one vote in SDV, uh, that one vote may actually help to elect more than one person. It's possible because of the proportional aspects of STV that one vote could contribute to the election of more than one person, could help more than one person get elected. And I'll just pick a very clear example that I think helps you to understand this. Imagine Smith is running uh, and Smith doesn't gain one quota of the votes, but in fact gains two quotas. Smith is so popular, everybody loves Smith, uh, that Smith gains two fifths of the total votes that are cast, two fifths of the first choices. Now, what that means is that Smith only needs half of each vote. Like Smith has to have a quota to get that seat. But when Smith is cashing out uh, all, all their votes, uh, they actually only need half of each of those votes because they got twice the quota. And what that means is that one half of every single vote that Smith has can now go to help someone else get elected. But of course, only only at half its value, right? It's not, not transferring a whole vote to someone else, only half a vote. And this is how this is how SDV creates the proportional results. This is how it manages to um, both give voters the power to choose who is who's going to get elected, but also uh, creates a proportional result for parties. And, and you'll see maybe when I show the ballot, you'll get a better idea of how that occurs. So this transferring of surpluses or eliminating of low vote getters continues until all the positions are filled. So in our, in our example of a five member riding, um, once five people have been elected through this process, then you're done and you don't have to do any more transferring of, of votes or eliminating of people from the ballot. Now here we've got a ballot used in, in the act, uh, which is the, um, the capital region of Australia. So ACT is its own sort of uh, area and they elect their own uh, governing body for the ACT uh, area. And so here's the ballot paper for uh, the SDV election to elect the members in ACT. And here you can see it talks about how you actually have to make a minimum number of choices. As I said, that's not a necessary part of SDV, but it's something that they do in Australia. And so here you can see how in voters are instructed to number seven boxes from one to seven, and then they can go further if they wish. Now, what I wanna draw your attention to here on the ballot is how the, the choices are grouped by party. And what you will typically see is that most voters will actually make their preferences entirely within those party choices. Uh, in other words, you know, there are a lot of people who, who are party uh, loyalists. And so they will say, look, I want, uh, you know, the, this member of, of, of the party I choose to win, but if that person doesn't have a chance, nobody else likes them, then I want my vote to go to this person. Or, you know, I want my vote to go to this person, but if they're so popular that they don't need as much of my vote, then I want some of my vote to go and help the next person on the list for that party. Of course, what is interesting about the SDV system is that it doesn't force voters to do that necessarily. Voters can choose to vote entirely along party lines, but they could actually give their votes to other parties, to candidates with other parties if they wish. Uh, so SDV is a very sophisticated voting system. It allows voters to make very sophisticated, um, give very sophisticated direction to the returning officer about the kinds of choices that they want to make. So. That is my basic, um, you know, introduction to these two systems. And I know that the experts we have with us today will have lots of nuance that they want to add to that discussion. And of course, uh, I can see we've got a lot of questions as well. So I'm going to turn it back over to Anita and she can move us along uh, with some questions or give me some direction on the things that she thinks we should get to answering. Okay, thanks a lot, Dennis. That was great. Um, so for those of you who are, if you are brand new to this and you're watching the chat, don't be scared. <laughs> <laughs> I would be. <laughs> if I looked at that 10 years ago, I'd be going, oh my goodness, what are these people talking about? So of course, when we do anything on voting systems, all the people that love voting systems show up and stuff. But this is an introductory thing for those who are just trying to get the basic idea. So one of the questions that I saw was when somebody was looking at mixed member proportional, they were saying, okay, so we have all the local candidates elected just like now, and then we have the regional 
pool, the party pool. So does that mean we need more politicians? Do you want to take that on, Dennis? Let me just, um, I'm sorry, you know, I got distracted because, you know, that you were talking about the chat box and then I was, I was noticing, oh, wow, look at all this chat in the chat box. My goodness, we, we, we have such a, a, a crew of experts uh, that are offering insights. So I got distracted. Sorry. That's you. okay. So one of the questions we get asked a lot is, does proportional representation require adding more politicians? Because we know about how popular that would be, like not. Uh, so do we need more MPs, even with mixed member proportional? If you're going to be electing regional MPs as well as your local MPs, does that mean we need more politicians or not? Uh, well, I mean, there's a trade-off, obviously, that if, uh, well, okay, the short answer is no. No, we don't. Uh, now, some might say maybe we don't need any politicians at all, right? I mean, ultimately, democracy does require some people to do the work. And part of the reason that people have those kinds of views about politicians is because they're frustrated. Right? I mean, people get angry and frustrated that the political system seems to be immune from voter pressure. So I think people have got to try to you know, put a break on those attitudes because we do need a certain number of politicians. And the smaller the group of politicians, the more people they have to represent and the farther they are from you. Um, so the, it's, it may seem counterintuitive, but more politicians actually creates more accountability to voters uh, because it means that you know, more views can be represented and more people can affect what those politicians do. But all I'm going to say on the question of do we have to have it is no. We could take the number of politicians that we have. We could divide them in half. Of course, to have an MMP system that would create proportional results, it would mean they would represent larger districts. And so that's the trade-off, is that people would have to reconcile the fact that the district would probably have twice as many people in it. If you're in a, if you're in a riding at the federal level with 100,000 people with a PR system, then suddenly you'd be in a local district with 200,000 people. So, you know, that's, that's the trade-off. Now, of course, on the other side, you'd have proportional results for parties. So this is where I think every Citizens Assembly has struggled with, you know, do we make the the proposal be larger or do we keep it the same i, I think you know that's a good discussion to have yeah i think the other thing to mention too is if you have a mixed member system and you have uh your local mp and they are representing a, perhaps a larger local riding now because we didn't want to add more politicians you will also have regional mps so if you don't like your local mp then you'll have probably two, three, four MPs, often of different parties that you can go to. So that's the flip side of that. You're not actually getting less representation. In a way, you're getting more representation because you're getting some choice now. So if you feel like your local MP isn't worth talking to because you didn't help elect them and they don't support your values, then you'll have somebody that who you elected on the regional side. And in sense. fact, you know, in Germany, it was the practice that people would shadow areas uh, so parties would look for areas that they didn't elect people directly uh, in the in the in the um, local riding, and they would assign MPs to look after that area. Um, and this is very popular. Voters like having choice. Voters like having more than one person to go to, or voters like to go to a, to someone that they think is going to be sympathetic to the issues that they care about. So it's a win-win, you know, in terms of uh, you know the quality of representation. Um, so somebody has asked, why is first past the post detrimental to the election of women and minorities, and how will PR remedy this situation? Now, those of you who want to dive deep on this, I have written a number of chapters on this specific topic, and you can find it on my Academia EDU site. If you just Google Dennis Pilon, you'll find lots of stuff there to bore you to tears, take you right to sleep at bed at night. Um, but I do have a couple of chapters where I... I, I look at the research on voting systems and what I call diverse representation. Again, I think we heard earlier, the short answer is that when parties can only put up one candidate in a riding, who gets that, who gets that nomination? Typically, it's men, uh, because they typically have more money. Um, they typically are, you know, enculturated to be more competitive. There are lots of reasons. Um, but the other factor is that in PR systems, because no one party ends up with all the power, um, it's, it's easier for parties to influence each other. And so what we've seen in looking at proportional 
countries with proportional representation is that when a new demand arises for diverse representation, uh, a party can create a contagion effect. And so uh, often, you know, if we look at uh, the Scandinavian countries as an example, you know, one party said, you know what, we're going to make getting more women elected a priority. And as they started to get attention and other parties said, hey, what's going on over there? Um, then it encouraged other parties to do the same. There is some of that that goes on in our system, but it's much slower. It's much slower. Uh, and so that's where uh, PR systems just respond more rapidly. Yeah, and an interesting thing that I came across, and I'm sure this isn't news to Dennis, but it was news to me in the last couple of years, is that there's actually more young MPs elected in countries with proportional representation, something like 15 times more 45 and under. So it's, again, it's that whole thing of, uh, you know, when there's multiple people that are able to run for one party, okay, if I'm, okay, I'm just going to make up a party here. You know, if I'm the Liberal Party, right, I have to run one person. Let's say there's an incumbent MP, they're a male, they're an, old, they're an older male, they won already, of course they're going to get the nomination. I mean, right, right now they're protected anyway, there's no competition. But suppose now they have to run three people mm -hmm. in that area. Are, do they, are they going to run three older white men? Would that reflect the diversity? No, of course they won't. They'll rep they'll put forward some choices for voters that reflect more closely the diversity of the region and they'll give people more choices and then younger people, racialized people can get into the game and be represented. So it's, it's a very complicated topic, but it does um, filter up. And then like Jenna said, it creates some little bit of competition in a good way. Um, so that we were getting the usual question, you might as well answer it, Dennis, about extremists. Does PR elect more right-wing extremists? Well, PR elects whatever people want. Um, so if if you know if there's some people out there who want an extremist party, then PR as a more as a more democratic, a more representative system, it's going to allow people to make that choice. Uh, is that something that we should be concerned about? Uh, I mean. You know, PR allows people to elect more left-wing parties. It allows people to elect, um, you know, parties on specific issues if they want. We can't know the answer in advance of, of, of adopting a system. But what we can do is look at what has occurred in other countries that are comparable to Canada. And if we look at the history of the post-war period in, in, in Europe, we find that for the most part, most voters don't vote for extremist parties. Um, that extremist parties, uh, parties, um, you know, anti-immigration parties or neo-Nazi kind of parties, fascist parties, uh, they have they have come and gone in the European scene. And the researchers have, who have looked at it have said that typically what happens is, you know, there's an outbreak of something, you know, a party rises up, and but but because no one will really work with them, um, then the voters after a while say, you know what, this isn't working, and they go and give their vote back to some other party. So, and it also creates responses from other parties. You know, my own view is that it's better that we know these things. Uh, it's better that these people aren't lurking or hiding in other parties, affecting policies behind the scenes, but that people can see uh, what it is that uh, some people are thinking and saying. Uh, forewarned is forearmed. Uh, and PR has a kind of transparency that I think is good for democracy. Yep. Um, so, so a couple of questions here. Does STV mean the electorate should have an opinion on each candidate to know how to rank the candidates, whereas MMP voters only have to know, like, less, I suppose? This is a really good question, and I, and I think a fair one. Uh, you know, we know from studying voters that voter knowledge is all over the map, right? There's some people who know a lot about politics and, and politicians, and other people don't. For the most part, people use party as a proxy for information about every single candidate. One of the reasons that voter turnout is lower at the local level is often because there aren't any parties there. And so people struggle to find out what the hell is going on in local politics. They, they have difficulty keeping track of what all the different politicians think. What we see in PR systems is that parties often step in and basically try to help their voters. 
So they provide them with how to vote cards. In, in Ireland, uh, there's an incredibly interesting uh, process of organizing voters that goes on, where parties divide up the multi-member constituency and they go into an area and a particular politician is responsible for you know, organizing those voters. So believe me, parties are not gonna let voters twist in the wind. Uh, they want to be successful. Some voters are gonna be able to use the opportunities the PR offers to the max and other voters are gonna to turn to parties and say, okay, you know, I like your party, what should I do? And parties will step in and, and, and help those voters figure out you know, what they might wanna choose in terms of the ballot. Right, so PR gives voters more choice, but they don't necessarily have to use it if they don't want to, they can just- If the worry is that voters are gonna find themselves flummoxed on election day, because there's so many choices, all I can say is that the evidence about, about spoilt ballots suggests that it isn't a problem. One of the ways we know if a system is too complicated is if voters are making mistakes when they vote. If we compare the rate of ballot spoilage in Canada with, say, Ireland, they actually have lower ballot spoilage in Ireland. So that tells us that people understand what's being asked of them. They're able to mark the ballots um, accurately, like in a way that is recognized by the returning officer as valid. And so I think that's really one way, it's a check on whether or not what we're asking voters to do is too much. Okay. Um, I, mean, I mean, I guess the other thing that, you know, when you look at an STV ballot, sometimes you can, or an MMP ballot, and you see all these names and you think, whoa, do I have to really have to know about all those people? No, not really. You know, like with MMP, you just have to pick one on the regional list side. One, if you know the party you like and the person you like from that party, that's it, one X, you know? And with STV, uh, the average voter in Ireland ranks four. So it's not like, I mean, you've got the political geeks that'll sit there and they'll figure out how to rank all 32 people on their ballot across party lines and are, you know, I mean, fun, fun, right? Fun times, but your average voter doesn't do that and people still get uh, proportional results. Um, so uh, there's a couple of people asking, this is another question that we get not fairly frequently. Uh, so can the, can the movement pick a system? Like how come we, how come we just don't pick one of these and just, just campaign for the one? Well, I think, you know, you know, as well as I do, Anita, that, uh, you know, you put, uh, you know, three voting system fans in a room and four voting systems come out, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's everybody's got their favorite. And this was an issue that was raised at the formation of Fair Vote Canada, uh, you know, and there were people, you know, trying to establish the one system. And very quickly, it just ran aground. Uh, we realized that if we forced, if we tried to force a choice, that we were going to split up the movement. And so to maximize unity on the issue of PR, uh, people sort of said, let's not have that debate. And so over the years, it's come up, it's come and gone. I think people have become a little more tolerant. My own view is that the details of the systems are much less important than the overarching effect that proportionality will have on the party system. And then by, a, by extension, the way parliament operates in government. The crucial thing is to break the back of phony majority government. It's phony majority government that creates so much of the drama and the things that people don't like about politics. And if we can come up with any PR system that will better represent what voters say and force parties to have to work together, then we will succeed. But you know, to come back to the question, why don't we choose? It's the politics, our own politics. And our own politics is that we are a, a multi- system group uh, where some people really like SDV and some people really like MMP. And so we just say, well, you know what? We are not going to make the choice for one. We're going to let it play out in the politics and, and see what happens. You know, and I would also say too that I think if us choosing one system and saying this is the right one for Canada, so says the electoral reform movement, would get us PR, most of us would say, okay, well, we're, we're in, you know, but the fact is it's not up to us. Uh, you know, it doesn't really, there's two main systems. They've been the same two systems that have been recommended by every single committee and commission for the last 100 years. They both deliver basically the same thing. You keep local representation, you get proportional results, and we get improvements and all these great things that we've talked about. So, and you have a choice of local MPs to go to. 
that's it. I mean, they're really, when you get into the details about it, you're just, you're arguing about different kinds of ice cream. Um, it doesn't really matter that much. It, and it's, it's not going to help us get PR just by hammering on one system unless one of the two big parties decides, I like that one better. And if, if, say, the Liberal Party decided tomorrow, I really like this proportional system, instantly there would be a big fan club around here for that system. Okay, bring it on. We're, we're in. Okay. But until then, it really doesn't matter. We've supported STV. We've supported MMP. We've put forward our own system. That's a lovely combination of the two that you can find on our website. Um, and, you know, we're continuing to promote the principle of proportional representation and be happy with any system. We're pretty much done fighting with each other in Fairville, Canada years ago on this one. Um, okay, so that goes to another question about basically how do we make this more attractive to the bigger parties who are obviously resisting this? I've got a bunch of variations of this question. What can we do about the prime minister's broken promise that this is the last election with first past the post? Which party or parties are convinced that PR is needed and which are not? Um, similar questions. Do you want to have a go well, with that, Dennis? I mean, you know, this is the $64 million question, right? I mean, you know, how do we get it? Um, we, we, we see a lot of people, you know, arguing over the minutia of different systems, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if we can't get them actually introduced. And it, that is, you know, basically the, the subject of most of my research is on this very question. Um, and so the answer is, uh, you, you know, Historically, PR has emerged at times of great uh, un unrest or um, instability, uh, ideological uh, contestation. Uh, that's been a big part of it. Um, often, the rise of more parties. This is why I tell people, uh, you know, the the move to multi-party uh, is one of the best indications. Uh, you know, people say, oh, if we got PR, we'll get a lot of parties. In fact, it's the opposite. The causal arrows suggest that it's the it's an increase in parties that moves existing parties to look at PR. Um, basically, a lot of work has been done with all the parties. Um, we have seen the parties move towards PR when it seemed they were facing some sort of existential crisis. So the conservatives, when they were split into two camps, uh, were more interested than when they reunited in one. The liberals found the topic much more interesting when they slipped into third place nationally um, than when uh, they were historically the alternate government. Um, the NDP has shown much more interest than the other major parties, uh, but then of course they've never come close to federal power. So that is one reason why. Um, obviously the Greens uh, have made PR you know, a fairly central part of their identity. Um, so we don't have an answer. Uh, you know, the, the, if we look at history, um, we can find lots of, of, of reasons why PR got past uh, the various gatekeepers. Um, but it, going into the future, it's hard to say what will tip things over. We came very close in a number of our referendums. Uh, and, you know, there but for fortune, we might be using PR today. So all I can say is that we need to keep doing the work that we're doing, which is to raise the issue publicly, um, keep putting pressure on the political parties, uh, and look for openings, right? We have to be ruthless in attempting to exploit and take advantage of whatever openings emerge. Um, and you know, there's, there's, a, there's a degree of kind of unpredictability uh, in this game that we hope we'll be able to take advantage of. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's the main work of Fair Vote Canada, two things, right? Is to help create the openings and to push every opportunity as far as we can. So those of you in Ontario uh, just saw that we did a major push on the Ontario Liberal Consul Consultation Survey where some PR supporters who are familiar to us worked with some liberals in the Ontario Liberal Party to get that on their survey, which is gonna influence their platform. And then when the survey came out, all of us were in there. Um, great participation from Fair Vote, okay? So that's a ex small example I'm talking about, about create the opportunity, push it as far as you can. I mean, that's what we can do. Somebody is asking, um, what are the advantages and disadvantages of you using a citizen's assembly to determine the proper, appropriate proportional system? 
Well, I, I'm not sure that there are any necessary disadvantages, except that governments in Canada have used citizens' assemblies in a, in a strategic way. Uh, so the Campbell Liberals, who were credited with this amazing innovation, uh, of course, hobbled it, you know, in the fine print. You know, the fine print was that, well, you know, we, we want a citizens' assembly, but we're not going to let them make the final decision, even though they're citizens. Uh, we're going to force it to go to a referendum where we'll ask a bunch of people who don't really know what we're talking about to weigh in on the topic now. Uh, and we'll also ask that it have a supermajority, even though there's no historical precedent for that. Um, so all, all kinds of ways in which... Uh, you know, governments in Ontario and in British Columbia rigged the game to fail. Uh, that is the danger of a citizens assembly, uh, is that you've got to read the fine print. Um, but, the, but, the, but the benefit of citizens assembly is that if you take, uh, you know, average folks and you give them the resources and you let them get up to speed on the topic, the evidence is they can do the work. And every citizens' assembly that I've been able to track, given a chance to make a decision about a voting system, has chosen either to go for or keep proportional representation. This was one of the criticisms of the right was that, oh, citizens' assembly, of course, they're going to choose something different. That's what they're built for. But they're not actually built just to choose something different. And the citizens' assembly in the, in the Netherlands was tasked with examining the Netherlands voting system, which is one of the most proportional voting systems in the world. And at the end of their process, they said, you know what, we're going to keep our PR system. So, you know, average folks get it, you know, they get the fairness, they get the basic schoolyard fairness that everybody should get their share. Um, and I think citizens assemblies can create a degree of legitimacy uh, for the process. But we have to recognize that our enemies do not stand still. And what was interesting about the change from 2005 and 2007 was that in 2005, the media in BC saw the Citizens' Assembly as this kind of cute thing, and they were quite supportive of it. By the time the Citizens' Assembly got to Ontario, the media had decided that this was a problem, and they came out guns blazing right from the start. Either they starved it of attention, or they used every chance to discredit it using all the old elitist tricks. Who are these people? What do they know? People like Ian Urquhart in the Toronto Star, which is supposed to be some kind of progressive paper, you know, spent all his time bad-mouthing the Citizens' Assembly. So we can't take the politics necessarily out. But I can say that I think the research supports the Citizens' Assemblies are a good way of working on these kinds of, of, of topics. Yeah, and uh, the main thing that we're pushing for in Fairvote Canada is a National Citizens Assembly on electoral reform, and we've been doing that for about two years, and we are going to continue to do that probably as long as it takes, because after 100 years of committees of politicians, what we found is you put the politicians in a room, and they can't do it. Sorry, they just can't, because they're basically designing themselves out of a job. They, they look at a map, and they go, oh, I don't like that my riding would get reconfigured this way, and then I'm being in competition with my friend over here, and we both couldn't run again, or we both might not get elected. And so there's, they have a different set of interests when they're looking at this situation, whereas when you sit voters down, um, they look at what's best for citizens and what's best for voters, and they can get a, a, us at least past that first step so it doesn't just get turfed like it did by uh, Mr. Trudeau in 2017 when he didn't like what the evidence said, right? And that the parties on the committee couldn't couldn't work together on this because they had different interests, right? Voters have the same interest. It's about creating a, a fairer voting system and better governance for everybody. But parties have partisan interest and we're trying to get that out of the first stage at least um, of the process. And oh, I want to back up what Dennis said too. In Ireland, they had a citizens assembly. It was actually two thirds citizens and one third um, TDs, which are MPs. And they looked at their voting system in 2013 and decided to keep the proportional system they have. So, I mean, again, it's, uh, it's not necessarily going to lead to change, right? It's just going to lead to an evidence-based decision. Um, do, are you seeing any more that we should address. I'm at seeing one person asking, what is a ranked ballot? Do you want to take that one, Dennis? Well, I, as we talked about earlier, like ranking is just a component of a voting system. And so it means that the voter can choose one, two, three, their preference. They can order their preference. They can say to the returning officer, hey, 
I really like this person. But, you know, if this person doesn't have any chance of winning, then I, I don't want to waste my vote. I want it to go to this person and then and, and, and so on. And so the ranking is, is just adding a level of sophistication. It's allowing the voter to convey something more sophisticated through their ballot. You know, if we think of the electoral system as a communication device, then uh, some voting systems are better at translating or communicating or broadcasting what people have said with their ballot. Um, you know, I, I was looking through all the questions here, um, and you know, wow, there's a lot of questions on the chat. I mean, I'm impressed with the depth, you know, the the level of discussion that's going on here. And obviously, we're not going to be able to go into all of the things yeah. that you've raised. Some of the things that people are talking about are themes that are dealt with in my book. I don't want to sound like I'm just plugging my book. I'm not making any money out of this, okay? But you know, some if you are interested in some of these questions, for instance, somebody asked about the Israel example, which of course is always thrown in our faces. Oh, Israel, you know, if we drop PR, we're just suddenly going to become Israel tomorrow. And so I deal with those arguments in the book. I've got a section where I, I talk about the two eyes, you know, Italy and Israel, uh, which is an example of what we call cherry picking. You know, the opponents, you know, choose the examples that they think are the most devastating uh, because, of course, that's part of the politics, right? Make your opponent look bad. Uh, as a researcher, you can't do research like that. You have to actually uh, come up with a representative sample. Uh, you have to you, you have to be able to argue that the choices that you have made, you know, do reflect the reality that you're trying to talk about. Someone else asked, you know, are there some good PR examples that we can look at? Absolutely. And I, I you know, often I tell people, you know, the best way to have a discussion about voting systems is to talk about real people in real places. You know, rather than engaging in fantasy speculation, oh my God, if we adopted PR, you know, we'd get extremism. You say. You know what? When we look at countries that are comparable to Canada, you know, in other words, they they have a similar political and economic development to us. So not Libya, not Rwanda. You know, those countries are obviously like totally different from us, right? So we compare countries like you know Germany or France or New Zealand, and we say, well, what has been the pattern of their politics using these different systems? And it's very effective. These countries are are, are all very successful countries. Um, they have not suffered, you know, political breakdown, um, and they've been able to do things in a way uh, that some people think are, are are really positive. So that's yes, I would say that's what people should do is as much as possible try to point to concrete examples of countries that are are using PR and managing to function very well. Yeah, and we talk a lot about New Zealand because we've witnessed their evolution under proportional representation in the last 20 years to be um, really effective, efficient, cooperative, you know, uh, like uh, we were talking about before the start of the webinar, almost top of the world on COVID. Uh, now, of course, it, they are an island. We get that. <laughs> but, you know, that uh, COVID management that was credited to Jacinda Ardern was the product of a three-party cooperative effort behind the scenes, you know, so sometimes cooperation can work better. Um, is there anything unique about Canada that would make any of those European PR systems not work in Canada? You know, everybody argues that their country is is unique. Uh, you know, everybody, you know, and that's one thing we've seen, you know, come out again and again in the various referendum campaigns. Oh, we can't do this in Canada. We're too freaky different. Um, no, I, I, I don't I don't think so. Uh, we can find similarities and differences. You know, if we, you know, people have said, oh, Scandinavia, you know, you can't compare us to them because, you know, they're all so homogenous. Well, actually, those countries were on the verge of civil war when they adopted PR. Uh, if you go back to the period in which uh, they made the decisions about their institutions, these were not homogenous countries. The, the degree of, of homogeneity is the result of the PR systems, that the PR systems has created a political dynamic where you don't see the sorts of division that we associate with other countries. On the other hand, look at the geography of places like Sweden or Norway or Finland. They are countries with you know, small urban centers at the bottom and huge expanses of you know, rural uh, areas. Kind of sounds like Canada, right? If we look at our, our provinces. Uh, so there's a lot of similarities as as well as differences. I, I don't find that argument a very compelling one. 
Yeah, I think the main thing that comes up when you look at some of the European systems compared to us is a lot of them use a variation of a party list sort of system. And in Canada, it's our tradition to have local representatives. Right. So that point. is why most of the PR world uses some variation of party list. But what we talk about in Canada is either mixed member proportional or single transferable vote, because those are the two that keep the local representation aspect. So that would be the only difference I would see. Anita, um, I'm going to skip back to Tom's yep. question. I noticed he, uh, he asked yeah. us, um, are we aware of any analyses that have captured the costs of winner-take-all systems? And in a way, I think your comments about Lippard uh, that you talked about in the in the early yeah. part of your presentation is is addressing that. So, Tom, if you have a look at some of Lippard's work, he's put together um, these arguments about the economic impacts of the different systems. Um, but I think you're asking a question that's even an even better one uh, than I think what Lippard's done, which is, you know, can we put a price? on the kind of policy lurch that we see in, in first past the post systems. Uh, that I think would be really interesting. You know, the, the example that's often used is British rail and how, uh, or British steel actually. So in the 1950s, uh, you know, it was nationalized by labor, then it was denationalized by the conservatives, then it was renationalized by labor, then it was denationalized by the, you know, what is the cost? of that kind of policy lurch. I think that's actually a really good uh, angle for, for further research. Yeah, and I think in Ontario, some Ontario we can see, right, that when Doug Ford came in, he canceled 758 renewable energy contracts. So that wasn't free. <laughs> you know, there was a lot of costs associated with completely canceling a program. And then four years later, or eight years later, someone reboots it, you know, hires those same sort of folks back, gets things going, right? So this is one of the reasons why PR countries are incrementally, I think, doing better than us on some of these issues because they're not involved in this back and forth thing. I mean, and the other part of that is that in winner take all countries, the par parties have to cater to this very small group of swing voters. And it's very easy, in my view, to scare them a little bit. So you don't want to do too much, you know, you're trying to please everybody all at once. Does that make sense? Do you know what I'm saying, Dennis? It's, yep. it's no, I, I think, uh, you know, it, again, it's a, it's a tribute to the, the, um, the complexity of these questions that people are asking. They're really putting us on the ropes here. Yep. Um, I notice in the, in the questions that there's a number of themes around uh, leadership accountability or local accountability. Um, you know, what kind of role would voters play in, uh, you know, who would get nominated by the parties. Um, you know, a lot of these things are about what affects parties, what kinds of pressure can be brought to bear on parties. Uh, and uh, of course, some parties care more and less about these topics, right? So typically right-wing parties, despite, you know, a lot of breast beating about the local member, are less concerned about those kinds of issues. And we tend to see the other parties spend more time on, um, you know, is our process fair? Is it equitable? Is it representative of all the different people? Um, one of the things that I think we see or can see in PR systems, depending on whether or not the public thinks these things are important, is that because the systems are more competitive, voters can move to politicians whose behavior they prefer. Our system gives voters very little strategic maneuver. You know, if you're a right wing voter and you're unhappy with your right wing party, you often have no choice but to continue to vote for that right wing party. You know, it's pretty silly to say, well, I'm going to make them accountable by voting for this left wing party. I mean, that's totally against your politics. And same on the left uh, or the center. But in a PR system, voters can make parties more accountable by voting for parties that are somewhat closer to them or adjacent to them. And we can find lots of examples of this, right? There was an example in Sweden where the Social Democratic Party had started to move to the center and abandon some of its traditional commitments. And this made a lot of their traditional supporters unhappy. And a significant number moved over to a left party that was further to the left. Well, that had the intended effect. The, the Social Democratic Party had to think, can we afford to lose those voters? Or are we gonna have to move back and take care of those voters? So I think that some of the issues that you're raising are not issues that we can necessarily legislate or bring in separate laws to deal with, but, but may be dealt with 
because the competitive dynamic in a PR system will be changed and voters will have more ability to discipline uh, the parties. Not all the power, of course, um, but I think more. I think that goes to, um, to individuals within a party. So say, suppose you're a diehard voter of party A, and, but you know, right now you don't like the local candidate. You don't, you, they're, they're lazy or you don't agree with them on something or something like that. If you're a supporter of that party, you can vote for that guy or that guy. That's it. That's your option, right? But if you have a mixed member system or you have a single transferable vote system, there will be a few people from that same party running. And so you can pick, it lets voters pick the best of the best from each party and hold the local individuals accountable so that you get the best team that's representing your area. So we have about, I'm going to take about one more minute here. And I had a couple more really basic questions. Um, election results. D does it take forever to get the election results after a PR election? Because the counting is so complicated. And also, does it cost more money? I just want to cover those basics. Uh, well, uh, again, it, it, it depends. Um, you know, as a rule, the PR systems take longer to uh, calculate the final results because, of course, they are a more sophisticated instrument. Uh, so in our system, we can usually discover the results fairly quickly because counting the votes is fairly simple. Um, but in a PR system where particularly there is more than one stage, yeah, the results may not be finalized until the next day, sometimes a couple of days. So yeah, it can, it can, take, it can take a little longer. Remember, of course, that our results on election night are only the temporary results, provisional results. And in, our, in, in most of our voting systems, uh, the final results are not finalized until weeks later as well. Uh, because there are postal ballots, and in some cases, ballots have to be moved from one location to another. BC has that situation where people can vote in any location. I want to jump in here uh, yep. before we sign off, because there are an awful lot of questions here, and I feel bad that we haven't been able to respond to them all. My God, I mean, it's, these are really excellent questions. You know, applause to all of you. Um, and I think there are questions we could answer, and I'm sorry that we don't have time to answer them. I don't know if there's a way in which we could keep these questions, and Anita and I could work on them and send them all out to everybody later on. I will say this. If you want to contact me uh, with your questions, I welcome them. Right, So just Google me, Dennis Pilon. You'll see my website come up, uh, which has my institutional address at, uh, at, at, uh, at York. And you can email me, uh, and I'm happy to take up you know, any, of, any of your questions that you may have. I would also say, too, that we're happy, Dennis or I, either one, both, you know, to do, when we have time, to do presentations to smaller groups. So usually, you know, out of every big group that gets the main idea, there's a small subset of people that just want to really dig in some more, you know, and uh, we're, that's why we're here. So, I mean, just get in touch and we can organize a time to do that. Um, you know, in terms of finding out the results, even in, some, even in a system like Ireland's where it is the most supposedly complicated system, they don't refer to it complicated over there, but here you would think it is, um, you know, by the end of the night, you know, most of the results, yep. you know, those last few might take a while to come in with the what, you know, but you're going to get the general gist of which party has got approximately how many seats fairly quickly. Um, and cost, there's no more cost to running a PR election. Aside, once you invest in, the, in any initial infrastructure that you need, it's not like it's more expensive. Do you have any more? Same with the costs, you know, people are asking about, well, you know, will it involve more costs with, with members having, you know, regional members and local members? Uh, really, it, it depends on how you organize things. Uh, one of the costs of having our system, or look at the American system, someone mentioned in the comments about how they've capped the number of, of uh, Congress people, and that leads to more and more people uh, in those uh, congressional districts all the time, half a million people in a congressional district. What that means is that those representatives have huge office staffs. So you're spending the money, right? You're not, you're not getting to, you know, if you have fewer MPs, you're not saving any money because often those MPs then just vote to get more staff so that they can deal with the volume of requests that are coming in. So all we're doing is rearranging the, the financial deck chairs here. We don't have to necessarily increase the budget uh, unless, of course, politicians decide to do that. Okay, 
So I want to thank everybody, the 130 of you that stuck it out for an hour and a half talking about voting system on mechanics night. on a Saturday night. Yay. <laughs> so uh, what you can do now, there's a few people have asked what you can do now. So right now you've probably seen that we have an action going lobbying the members of the Standing Committee on House and Procedural Affairs proc. Uh, they are going to be voting on a motion for a National Citizens Assembly on electoral reform. So if anybody missed that, check your email. Uh, we need you to send a letter to those 12 MPs copied to uh, Prime Minister Trudeau and Dominique LeBlanc asking them to vote yes. And the vote is to do a study. So that's all we're asking, to do a study of a National Citizens Assembly. And that vote could be coming up anytime. So that's the next thing that we need your support with. Okay, so thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. And uh, we hope that we'll be able to do this again periodically. We put this on because we have so many new people on our mailing list, which is wonderful. So we really appreciate your support. Okay, have a good night. Thank you, Dennis. It's been great.